folks, if you want to come to the front, there are still a decent number of seats in the front of the room. There's also another door uh, in the front that makes the front a little bit more accessible. For those of you joining us online, we just did an unveiling of the relief statue outside. And so folks are coming back into the room, taking their seats, and we'll get started shortly. Still a few more seats. All right, I think I'll go ahead and start with the introductions. Uh, so good evening and welcome to tonight's presentation. My name is Dr. Nick Sines, and it's my delight to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Uh, this event marks a continuation of several speaker presentations commemorating Adams 100, the Adams State University Centennial Celebration. Please join me in a moment of reflection as I recite the Adams State University Land Acknowledgement Statement. Nosotros, la comunidad de Adams State University, reconocemos con gratitud a los pueblos indígenas en cuyas tierras ancestrales nos juntamos. We, the Adams State University community, greatly acknowledge the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands we gather. Este hermoso Valle de San Luis es sagrado para diversas naciones indígenas, incluidos los Utahs, Apaches y Carías, Comanches, Kiwas, Arapajos, Chayanes, Navajos, Pueblos y todos los otros pueblos originarios que creaban un hogar en este valle. This beautiful San Luis Valley is sacred to many indigenous nations, including the Utes, Hikaria Apaches, Comanches, Kiowas, Arapahos, Cheyennes, Navajos, Pueblos, and all other first peoples who once made this valley their home. Honremos a la diversidad de comunidades que históricamente moraban aquí y a aquellos que hoy en día, hoy en día uh, viven en el Valle de San Luis. We honor the diverse communities that historically dwelled here and those who currently reside in the San Luis Valley. Sabemos que honrar a las tierras en, es un proceso, proceso reflexivo que demanda un continuo compromiso y acción. We know that honoring these lands is a reflective process that demands continued engagement and action. Sea que recordemos siempre el viaje de los antepasados que llamaban a este valle hogar. May we always remember the journey of the past peoples who called this valley home. Before introducing tonight's speakers, I'd like to thank our sponsors for making tonight's event possible. Alamosa State Bank, First Southwest Bank, San Luis Valley Federal Bank, Alamosa County, and the Adams State Office of Title V Initiatives. Their support has allowed tonight's event and others like it to take place. Tonight's presentation on the Mestis case of 1914 invites us to consider how, we have, how far we have come as a community. Reaching back more than a century, it reminds us that only a few generations separate the experience of Whitney seeing segregation in Alamosa and the designation of Adams State University as Colorado's first Hispanic-serving institution in 1998. My first exposure to the Mestiz case took place a number of years ago when I served as president of the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area. Created by Congress in 2009, uh, the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area seeks to preserve, protect, and promote the rich history and culture of the San Luis Valley. Currently up for reauthorization, you can support the work of this important Valley entity by writing your congresspersons to express endorsement of its work. The Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area has served as fiscal agent for the Mestiz Case Committee and aided in its efforts to bring public attention to a truly fascinating episode in the nation's history. A fifth generation resident of, San, of the San Luis Valley, Judge Gonzalez was born in Alamosa in 1952 he obtained his JD from the University of Colorado Law School in 1978. After completing his legal studies, Gonzalez engaged in a general practice of law with an extensive civil practice and county government representation before serving as the juvenile magistrate for the 12th Judicial District in 1997. In January 2001, he was appointed as the first Hispanic Alamosa County judge 
and later in August 2007 as the first Hispanic district court judge. Judge Gonzalez has been involved extensively in community activities, especially those involving mental health and children. He has served on many nonprofit boards, including the SLV Community Corrections Board, the SLV Regional Medical Center Ethics Committee, the Colorado Hispanic Bar Association, the SLV Mental Health Center, SciCare LLC, the 12th Judicial Juvenile Services Committee, the State of Colorado Restorative Justice Council, and significantly, the Mestis Case Committee, which he directs as chair. Ronnie Mondragon works as the research attorney for the 12th Judicial District, which includes all six counties in the San Luis Valley. Originally from Alamosa, he attended college at CSU Pueblo and law school at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. After finishing law school, Ronnie looked for job opportunities in the San Luis Valley and in the fall of 2017, was hired by the 12th Judicial District where he has worked ever since. In 2018, he was invited to join the Mestis Committee. He continues to assist the group in research of the court records pertaining to the case. Quote, I've, been, I've enjoyed being involved because the Mestis case is extremely important and needs to be brought to light. It also literally hits home for me. I should note that Judge Gonzalez's theme is, so what? Why should we care? He will briefly begin in Spain and consider that country's rule of this region before turning to the Mexican period, and finally, the era of rule by the United States with special emphasis on the state of Colorado. His remarks will focus on the rise of the case, how the SBMDTU played a role, the litigants, the attorney, and finally, the ruling. Circling back to, so why care? He'll present what the committee is doing today, Ronnie will then talk about his experiences as a Hispanic man seeking a law degree, why he sought that path, and why mentorship and education is so important. So please, please join me in welcoming Judge Martin Gonzalez and Ronnie Mondragon, Jr. <laughs> Thank you much. Uh, you know, there's chairs down here. Just saying. Uh, you remind me of me in law school. I was always in the back. <laughs> but at any rate, I, I do want to welcome you all here. It, it's heartfelt uh, to me to uh, see so much interest uh, being generated in this community and see my friends and my family and, and, and others that I hope to get to know down the road. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you're hopefully will be somewhat entertained, perhaps stimulated, and at least have a, a question in your mind. And I'll raise that question here in a little bit. This case is, is older than Adam State. This case is older than I suspect most people that are living right now. I don't think anybody is alive that was back in 1914, maybe. We are long lived, but I don't think so. This case was created around the time that the Alamosa County was created. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I think that fits into this process. But it was an old case and it got lost. And the question as to why it gets lost is always asked to me. So let me start off by saying this. I think one of the predominant reasons it got lost is because in my profession, the judicial system being what it is, unless a case gets appealed, it doesn't get written about, and it doesn't get disseminated through law books as having some sort of precedential value. We can explore, speculate why it wasn't appealed, but nonetheless, it was not appealed. Interestingly enough, it was also lost because even the school records don't exist on this case. Why? I'll speculate a little bit. I suspect that people were perhaps a tad embarrassed by the whole thing. Pure speculation, pure speculation. It also got lost because the papers that were local didn't much appreciate the case at the time. In fact, has some fairly disparaging comments to make about it, and one of which I will point out. So my question is, and it's a question that was put to me some time ago, 
So what? Ike, who cares? My hope is that after I finish here, you will understand at least why it means something to me. And at the end, I'm going to speak specifically to why it means something to me. But for now, I would just ask that you, in your own minds, go back three, four, five generations of your family. Three, four, five generations of the community. Three, four, five generations of your religious affiliations, whatever they may be. And put in your own mind, what are those seminal points in the history of those histories, of those times? Mark what makes you, what makes the community, what makes that particular religion. And keep that in mind as I go through this a little bit. Think specifically of your own family history and where they came about and where they came from and what is meaningful to them. My hope is that you will come to understand at least what's meaningful for me. I'm starting with this point when the Spanish arrived. And I could go back to the, to the indigenous. But the reason I chose this particular point for my discussion is because Spain comes here to the New World, comes here to this area, and they brought with them their culture, and they brought with them their language. And that language is the basis of some of the controversy that ultimately this case is about. So, I refer to my people as mi raza, my raz. That's how I grew up referring to my people. So you're going to see me intersperse that uh, label throughout my talk. My raz, mi raza, trace our roots 400 years ago. 400 years ago, most of the people who go back, as far as my family goes back five, six generations, trace their roots to Santa Fe, northern New Mexico. We trace our roots to this event. We trace our roots long before the United States showed up. Keep that in mind as you put this thing in perspective. Mirasa was here around the same time that Jamestown showed up, and certainly before Plymouth, Massachusetts showed up. That's how far back we go. Some of the history books that I've read talk about how those settlements were the first settlements. Not really sure that's true. I suspect it's not. This is another seminal event in the history of this region of Mirasa. This revolt is unique for one particular thing. It's the first conflict between indigenous and Spanish speakers to the incursion of the United States government into this area. That's the significance of that particular event. This particular event happened less than 100 miles away from where we now sit. That's not a long ways. That is not a long ways, both in time and distance, I submit. This struggle would ultimately culminate in a war called the Mexican-American War. And in that resolution of that particular conflict, we come up with the Treaty of Guadalupe. So, this is what this area looked like in 1810, I think is what this map is. I chose this particular map because it shows just how extensive, compared to the United States, this area and its roots was. It pales in size. 
Now think of the distances. You got Mexico City, most of my, most of my raza, sometimes I think our, our families don't really recognize our political connections to Mexico City because it was so far that it became almost irrelevant in the development of this area. The 1810, this is an area where manifest destiny becomes a real doctrine of the United States. It's, an er it's a time in which the impetus for slavery states started in part the impetus for the state of Texas. That's what that was about. Those were struggles that this area endured, suffered, and succeeded in overcoming, I submit, in our own inimitable way. Mexico gained its independence from Spain in 1821 after 11 years of war. Interestingly enough, when Mexico became a republic, they opened up the borders. Why did they open up the borders? Because they wanted people to populate this area in order to protect this area. That's what that was about. That particular piece of governmental action resulted in a large incursion of Anglos from the east, Tennessee, et cetera. They came for the things that my people came here for, for land, for an opportunity to start. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But imagine what happens when you've got that incursion into that area and what it means for conflict. Conflict of culture, conflict of languages. That war, the Mexican-American War, was a straight up war of expansion. If you want to read about that war, the book I would recommend is this puppy. It's called A Wicked War. It's written by Amy Greenberg. The title comes from, interestingly enough, a quote by Ulysses S. Grant in 1879. And he says, I do not think there was ever a more wicked war than that waged by the United States on Mexico. I thought so at the time when I was a youngster. Only I had not moral courage enough to resign. Interesting, isn't it? That particular war is, by the way, how David Thoreau ended up in jail in protest for that war. So, nonetheless, the war happened. Nonetheless, all that conflict and the resulting conflict produced an incursion of the English language into this area. Then we get into the state of Colorado, not so many years after the war. Those are the two relevant uh, maps that I wanted to show you. The original 17, and then what was in 1911? And this was before Alamosa was created. So now let's focus a little bit more on the locale. Canales County was a big county. It was created during territorial times, before statehood. Canales County ultimately got carved up and Alamosa was created in 1913. That date's important because that date was in the transition of the case and its struggle. Now, also consider what the political milieu was in that period of time. In this state, you had an increasing prevalence of the KKK and its activities. 
ultimately reached in, in 1920 to being able to take over the uh, aspects of state government as well as city government in Denver. That's how powerful that struggle became for them. So, we have the beginnings of real severe divisions of race, religion, and class. Why were Hispanics in Alamosa? It's a railroad town. We wanted work. That's why we came, predominantly. Now, you've got a little bullet point on the bottom that talks about Hispano lore. And I'm here to tell you my understanding of that lore as I understood it growing up. And as I was told by the viejitos, Alamosa was created as a response to the extensive Hispano void votes in Canales County. That's why it was created in Hispanic lore. Was it the reason? I don't know. I'll leave it for you to decide. But that's the lore. That's the lore. That's how the locals, Mirasa, looked at the creation of this particular county. So, obviously, we have the development of many contradictions and points of view and struggle. And in that milieu, Hispanic organizations started springing up all over the Southwest. Many, not just one, not just this one, many. This one, La Sociedad, of which I am a member, La Sociedad Protección, Protección Mutual de los Trabajadores Unidos, is now the longest standing, continuous running civil rights organization for Hispanics in the United States. And where did it get created? In Antonito, in the San Luis Valley. And it's still going strong. We are in the throes of a remodeling project. And we're going to be spending a lot of money to get that building in Antonito back up to stuff and hopefully have events there. One of my particular dreams is to have a think tank institute centered at that particular building down the road. Who knows if it'll happen. So, the Sociedad is an avowedly nonviolent brotherhood designed to, create, to combat discrimination in all its forms. It was at one time a very big organization in the Southwest. We're down, down to Rogelio, what is it, six concilios? Uh, yeah, I think it's six concilios that we're down to. But it's growing. Every day I'm getting people asking for how do, you, how do I get part of that organization involved? How do I do that? And what I want to do? And how do I get involved in the organization itself? So, interestingly enough, that particular organization was and still is an avowedly patriotic organization. Our rituals include allegiance to the flag and allegiance to this country. It was not an organization of, of succession. My paternal grandmother and grandfather were members of the Concilio Número Dos in CAP. I'm proud of that. My maternal grandmother was a member. I'm proud of that. My hope is by being a member of that organization, in some way I carry on that legacy. So, I'll explain a little bit later why I think that particular organization is important to this thing. These are the two schools that existed. You have the Mexican school, and you have the, what was referred to in the papers as the American school. Interesting diversion, right? Interesting. So, again, remember what I asked you? Put yourself in, your own, in that context. So I want to ask you to put yourself in the context of those two schools and a community that saw fit to create that division. Now I want you to 
think about being a student who has to walk in the middle of the winter in Alamosa, blocks, several blocks, to get to a school that's further away than the school that's next door. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up here remembering vividly 40 below winters. We don't see that very often, but I think it was a lot more prevalent back then. It was that circumstance of those two schools that's the catalyst for this case. So, you got Miguel Ballestas, 10 years old, having to walk from the north side to the south side, the, div the division that in many respects still exists. Seven blocks from the north end to Ross and Ninth. There's a park there now. You don't see the building anymore. But that's where it was. This particular school, the Mexican school, was really started in 1912. And not long after the school was opened, and it was intended, I think, with perhaps some good thoughts, and that is to provide a mechanism for education of the monolingual Spanish speaker. That is not how it turned out, in fact, as a matter of policy. As a matter of policy, everyone with a Hispanic surname was required to go to that school, regardless of whether or not they were proficient in English or not. Mirasa didn't like that. They viewed it as racial discrimination. I think it was. I think it was. A visiting Jesuit priest on that visit in 1912 reflected on the social environment that existed and stated, and I'm going to quote, the Americans in that community that built a school where the Mexicans alone came together so that American boys would not have to mingle. That was the perspective, at least, that Jesuit priest had. So the genesis of this case is that while their initial concept was to deal with monolingual Spanish speaker, a certain individual, I submit, this individual, Superintendent Thomas made the rule. You're Hispanic, you go there, regardless of your capacity for English. That's the genesis of this case. What I think was perhaps good intentions gone awry. And remember, put it in the context again of the rise of the KKK, the rise of, the, of all these contradictions and all these struggles because otherwise you can't understand why this happened. So, again, Thompson just apparently assumed that if you're Spanish surnamed, you needed to go where they wanted you. Mirasa looked at it as discrimination. And being Mirasa, we started struggling. We started organizing. We started petitions, meetings, organizing, even to the point of having a boycott of the school itself. Probably the first vestige of a school walkout, at least in the state of Colorado. All right? I believe the SPMDTU was in the background. I believe that in many respects, they were the intellectual stokers of what was going on there. I want to give particular notice of Mr. Roybal. Mr. J.R.C. Roybal. I would love to have had a conversation with that gentleman. He was a teacher at the Mex Mexican school. He ultimately started fighting against the Mexican school. He was a great organizer of what ultimately happened in that struggle. 
There is a mention in a particular history put together by Jose Timoteo Lopez, who was from CAP, by the way. He wrote the book when he was in Utah. He makes mention of the SPMDTU starting a committee to deal with this problem. I think it was that committee that was a great force for what was going on here. So, efforts are made. Being what we are, we ask politely. Got turned down by the school board. We asked politely by the state. Got turned down. Efforts ultimately resulted in the attempts in the court. The flavor of what was going on in the community is best answered, I think, by this little blurb in the local paper. I'll let you read it for yourself to let it sink in. You can all read and write English, right? <laughs> just, just kidding. Bottom line is, they could not think of anything worse than Mirasa succeeding at the efforts. That was the flavor of the journalists of that day. So we have the litigants. We have Francisco Maestas, supervisor with the railroad, and his wife, Margarita, and their children, of which one of them was Jose. He asked for his son to be in the school that's closest to him and was turned down. He was not the only one that was turned down. Others were turned down. The reason we use the maestas is because the way the case is titled, he's the first name that shows up. Okay, that's, that's all that's about. The, well, let's see. Lawsuit was handled by a very young lawyer. And those of you that want to be lawyers, this is a guy to think about. It had to have been one of his first cases. Had to have been, as young as he was. He filed a suit describing what he believed the actions of the school board as discriminatory. And he points out at the time that he filed this action, there were 800 Mexicans in the city, 150 of them were youngsters. He maintained in his suit that the school was making a distinction and classification of pupils, of pupils contrary to a particular Article 6, Section 8 of the Colorado Constitution. And that's an interesting point. This was not a federal suit. This was a local suit based upon state constitution. This is the article in effect at that time. Notice the last points, nor shall any distinction and classification of pupils be made on account of race or color. My colleague Ron is going to talk a little bit about how that nuance fit into this struggle, because it's very interesting the way Mirasa in this area attacked this problem. The prosecution, i.e. Mr. Sullivan, i.e. Mirasa, based their case upon that particular constitutional article, stated as a matter of fact that the Mexicanos, the Mirasa, were a distinct culture and were being discriminated against, that the school board didn't want kids being mingled, and ultimately put students as well as community members on the stand to prove these factual points. The defense was, and here's the point that Ron's going to get into, whoa, 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 you're Caucasians, 
Now, why did they make that, car, that argument? Because the Treaty of Guadalupe by fiat declared everybody who was here at the point that the treaty was created to be Caucasian because you can't be a citizen without Caucasian blood. That's why that happened. They further argued that the students had English language deficiency and some other arguments, but those are the main ones. The outcome, Judge Holbrook decided in favor of the prosecution, in favor of Miraza, in March of 1914, after Alamosa had been created as a county, and stated that basically Mexican-American students had the right to attend public schools nearest their homes if that was their choice provided, and there was a proviso in there, that they in fact were proficient enough. What is interesting about his opinion is, one, we don't really know what was said. We can surmise based upon certain newspaper articles, particularly the Catholic Register, which was a great resource for information. The local papers were useless. One of the things that Judge Holbrook said in rendering his opinion was as follows. In the opinion of the court, the only way to destroy this feeling of discomfort and bitterness which has recently grown up is to allow all children. So. So what? Ike. What does it matter? Why do I care? Why do I want to make you care? I want to say that it's because of who I am. I want to shout it's because of who I am that I must look to my history to define that to define that who in fact I am. That that history of which this case is part defines Mirasa in this area, even though we didn't know it. Our history in subtle and not so subtle ways must provide a sense of, a sense of who, are, who we are and I submit to you, if you don't know about this case, you may not really know who you are because you may not really know who your grandparents were or who your great-grandparents, like Rosie said. Those are some strong people. They stood up for their rights. So, like all peoples, Mirasa, take it upon ourselves, and must take it upon ourselves to understand our history and to share it. Only then can we truly have equality between the cultures, between the races, between the communities, amongst ourselves. Anything else is, in my estimation, living something of a bit of a lie, ignoring the hard facts, glossing over the struggles. And I'm here to tell you, don't gloss them over. The struggles that your grandparents went through defines you. The struggles that your people went through defines you. Whether you're Anglo, whether you're Dutch, whether you're Mirasa, whether you're Indio, whatever, it defines you. Know it, learn it, expound it, shout it from the rooftops if you have to. So that's really um, what I really have to say today. Um, our commemoration efforts are long and varied. We've had. Colorado Senate rev resolutions already issued. PBS has done some segments. You may have seen them. There's efforts being made for a curriculum at the high school and college level over this case. There's going to be a tribute at the state capitol this Thursday, at which time the traveling road piece will be there for, at the state capitol for a little bit. We're hoping to have it at the Colorado History Museum locations the uh, Judicial Department building, 
So this is the committee. I won't go through the names too much, saving except for one in particular. Ruben Donato, Gonzalo Guzman, Jared Hansen wrote a piece in 2017, Francisco Meneses et al. versus George H. Schoen et al. Mexican-American resistance to school segregation in the Hispano homeland, 1912-1914. Read this piece. It's a wonderful piece. These are the guys that came to my court asking for, for a copy of the case. I owe, and I submit, we all owe these guys a great round of thanks for what they have done. They have done immensely. Um, uh, hey, they have immensely furthered our understanding of our own history. So with that, Ronnie has a few comments to make specifically about that interesting nuance on how this case came about. Ronnie? Thank you, Judge. Well, what a tough act to follow. <laughs> now that I'm up here, I realize I probably should have went before him. <laughs> On a serious note, I'm truly honored to be here. I feel privileged to be able to discuss the Maestas case at Adams State University. Um, I want to say thank you to the ASU folks who helped put this event together. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Katie Doxson, who's also a member of the committee. As uh, Judge Gonzalez indicated before we came in here for the presentation, she's a spark plug of the committee. And I think tonight is a prime example of that. Um, well, I didn't go to college here at ASU. I went to college up the way in Pueblo. I still kind of feel like this is my school. It's uh, definitely my family school. My parents are both ASU graduates, and my wife and brother are current students as well. So that just adds to the pleasure I take in being able to discuss this landmark case on this campus. As I'm sure you can tell, there are many fascinating aspects of the Maestas case. Tonight, I want to highlight some things I think we ought to keep in mind going forward. To me, the Maestas case is about taking pride in your culture, about using education to shape your future, and about accepting help along the way, as well as paying it forward when you're in a position to do so. I first want to talk about the school officials' assertion that the Chicano students were actually Caucasian. Uh, then for the educators and the current and aspiring students, I. I want to take a couple minutes to acknowledge just how powerful education is, not just with respect to the end result of formal education, but the entire process. Uh, as Leroy and Rosalie Martinez noted, education has long been referred to as the great equalizer. In my view, that's spot on. Finally, I want to emphasize how this case uh, serves as a reminder of the responsibility we all share, and that's to serve as mentors, especially when it comes to children. Before I get into these points, though, I want to briefly talk a little bit about my journey. I, I can remember being 16, 17 years old and feeling uncertain about what the future had in store for me. I had a lot of good friends that found themselves on the wrong path, some dropped out of school, some got mixed up with drugs, and some got in trouble with the law. Unfortunately, some did all of those things. I was incredibly lucky, though. Uh, what made the difference for me was I had a stellar support system. I had a, a couple teachers that never gave up on me. But above all else, I was blessed, blessed with amazing parents that not only set an excellent example for me, but constantly guided me and helped me find my way. They taught me to take pride in my culture, to draw inspiration from it, 
and to aim high. So I stand here tonight knowing full well I wouldn't have been able to become an attorney, but for my parents and their unconditional support. Um, so I'll forever be indebted to them for that. I wanted to share this because I think it goes to show how supporting others, especially young people, can go a long way. As Judge Gonzalez indicated, I, I want to address a legal tactic the school officials used. They contended the Rasa students were Caucasian, and therefore there was no distinction on the basis of race. Uh, Raymond Sullivan, the attorney that re represented the Maestas, questioned a school board member on this point, and uh, the school board member actually said he would never permit his children to attend school with the Mexicans. So that cast serious doubt on whether those calling the shots truly considered the Chicano students Caucasian. What was really going on was either the school officials painted with too broad a brush, or worse, they simply used language issues as pretext to implement the segregation policy. As you heard, we have some historians on the committee that wrote a top-notch article about the Maestas case. These historians, Ruben Donato, Gonzalo Guzman, and Jared Hansen, pointed out that the Maestas family pushed back on the school officials' characterization of their race. The historians explained the Mexican-American plaintiffs asserted that race was a driving force behind the school officials' actions to segregate their children. The plaintiffs rejected their legal status, their legal white status, and claimed that they were racially distinct. Now, I realize a lot of this boils down to the party's legal strategy, but I think there's more to it, especially from the Chicano's perspective. Uh, some would probably say I'm biased, being that I'm from the area, but I genuinely believe the San Luis Valley is about as rich as it gets culturally. I know I felt that growing up, uh, paying homage to our culture and, and preserving it is something that has always been important to us and something that my parents constantly preached. This aspect of the Maestas case makes me think about one of my favorite writings, a poem called I Am Joaquin that was written by Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez. And uh, for the record, that's not Judge Gonzalez's brother. I, I, did, I, read, I looked into that. <laughs> the following is uh, my favorite part of the poem, and it's directly relevant to the school officials' uh, assertion that the Chicano students were Caucasian. And in all the fertile farmlands, the barren plains, the mountain villages, smoke-smeared cities, we start to move. La raza, Mexicano, Espanol, Latino, Chicano, or whatever I call myself. I am the masses of my people, and I refuse to be absorbed. The Maestas family and others in the same situation embody these words. I think it goes to show how much pride they had in their cultural identity and how they didn't want to become a forgotten ingredient in the melting pot. In short, they refused to be absorbed. The next thing I want to talk about might be stating the obvious a little bit, but I think it's worth reiterating, and that's that education is extremely powerful. We wouldn't be here tonight if it wasn't for Leroy and Rosalie Martinez. They, committed, uh, they contributed greatly to the committee's mission, and they did so because they wanted future generations to continue to learn from the past and push forward to a brighter future. Uh, those words really resonate me, with me, especially, especially that lap, the last bit, to push forward to a brighter future. I think that's exactly what education is all about. I know I found my journey through college and law school transformative, I quickly began to realize that my efforts were paying off, and I'm not just talking about grades or uh, job prospects, it's deeper than that. My journey through school allowed me to face the future with confidence, confidence that I otherwise wouldn't have had. So 
I'd argue education represents one of the sturdiest bridges between the present and the future. And I remember hearing somewhere that uh, education is, is like the, a master key that's capable of opening countless doors. And I'd, I'd argue that's an accurate description. Additionally, education leads to a lifelong passion for learning, or at least it should. I think uh, that's one of the principal goals of formal education is to give students the tools to continue to educate themselves for the rest of their lives. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is how important it is for people to have mentors in their lives, especially young people. As you heard Judge Gonzalez talk about, um, the lawsuit followed efforts of many in the community to change the status quo. And I think uh, the students, even though they were young, recognized that community members went to bat for them. That sort of support goes a long way. I think the ripple effect of that sort of support is something we should be inspired by as we try to make a difference as well. There's a theme that I'm getting at here, and it's that support is critical. It's absolutely critical. I can't stress that enough. Um, if I could give advice to current students, the one thing I'd say is to find a mentor. Find a mentor you look up to and take advantage of the knowledge and wisdom others share. My experience has been most people are willing to lend a helping hand. If I've done one thing right in my journey, it's that I listen to my mentors, maybe not the first, second, or third time. <laughs> I've, been, I've been known to be a little stubborn, but eventually I listened. Um, so I would just uh, encourage students to do that and to take advantage of the guidance others are, are willing to offer. It's a, it's a long journey. You know, everybody's bound to hit bumps in the road and uh, we're all going to have to fight to overcome adversity at some point. So lean on others. I, there's nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't be afraid to lean on others for support. Throughout my studies in college and law school, uh, and while I prepared for the bar exam, my wife always had my back through thick and thin. Uh, that's something that I'll be forever grateful for, and I hope I could do the same for her as she continues in her journey through college herself. The message I'm getting at here is uh, nobody does it alone. Uh, I think you should always keep that in mind. Uh, I think the thing to strive to do is uh, you know, accept the help and be grateful. Be grateful for the help others offer, and in turn, pay it forward. When you're able to, uh, help build others up, inspire them, and let them know that they're not in it alone. To me, that's one of the main takeaways of the Maestas case. It's a reminder of our responsibility to ignite the flame in others, the flame that represents a commitment to not squander the opportunity that in the not so distant past wasn't available to everyone. So I, I would conclude with that. I'd, ask each of you to join me in pledging to do our best as we try to be beacons of hope, not just with respect to education, but in life in general. On behalf of the committee, I just want to thank you all for being here tonight. That concludes what I have to say. But we really appreciate you all coming out for this event. It's the first of many, and this thing is quickly gaining momentum. So I think we'll all be here, we'll all remember being here tonight. I truly believe that. This is the first of many events in one day. I think this case is gonna be part of the curriculum, coast to coast and border to border. Thanks, 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 Just a couple of final comments. This is the beginning of a process. And that process is going to reach a culmination on October 8th at the courthouse in Alamosa, which is when that piece gets permanently placed over there. So 
I urge you to pass the word. I urge you to become involved. I urge you to be educated. And you can do that by going to the maestascase.com. And the case file's there. Many of the articles and pieces and public uh, PBS stuff is on there. And uh, I think you'll find it uh, informative, if not enjoyable. <laughs> I think it is enjoyable, but that's just me. Uh, with that, thank you all. Judge, would you take a few questions? Sure. Would anyone like to pose a question? Only the ones I can answer, please. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, uh, a comment, something that I'd like to, a comment or something I'd like to mention is that this notion of Caucasian or not still exists today, and we experience it every 10 years when we do the census. How do Hispano, Latino people identify racially? And it's still something that's very, very muddied. So I just bring that up as something to keep in our minds that for us to keep thinking about. You know, the perception is that Hispanos are a single unit unified. The fact of the matter is we are as varied as the sun rays. Uh, I refer to myself as Chicano or Mirasa, Latino. But there are others who take umbrage with that. There are those in my own family who will say, no, I'm an American. I don't want to hear that hyphenated stuff. All right? So how you check the box? The way you want to, I guess. I want to say, or K-1. So do you believe that's why the school, because if you look at the Valley, we're the only school district that has it that way. Polston was K-1, Boyd was 2-3, then Evans was 4-5. But now we're all together at the, you know, K-2, 3-5. So is that the birth of why? Well, I think that has some genesis to why, but you've got to remember in the Alamosa School District educational process, there was a thing called the Alamosa Plan. And what it did is it consolidated all these little neighborhood schools into, into Alamosa. And so that, that plan was really the genesis of, I think, of what you're talking about. But I think what's interesting to me is the fact that this case didn't get appealed, which tells me that the light went on in their head this isn't right. Maybe we should change how we perceive this, this process. That's what I'd like to believe. So that's what I believe. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, Gonzalo Guzman is an educational historian. He was having a conversation with a viejito up in Erie, Colorado. And the viejito says, well, there's that case in Alamosa. And nobody knew what he was talking about. And so they dug a little bit more, ultimately contacted the courts. And you've heard the story about how I, at least I got involved in the, in the process. So quite frankly, by happenstance, a mere conversation led to the discovery or rediscovery of this case. Ah, oh, we bored you to death already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> There's cookies. I should, have, I should have gone through my presentation before. I didn't realize it was going to be that freaking long. Yeah.